in the Gospel of St. Thomas, Jesus says to his disciples, if they ask you, what is the sign of the Father in you? Tell them it is a movement and a rest. What is the sign of God's being in us? It is both a movement and a rest. The rest is to do with our inner experience, the movement, our outer experience. If the rest is experienced as peace, the movement is experienced as joy. If the rest is experienced as love, the movement is experienced as praise or celebration. These are the, the two aspects of God's being. In the Vedantic tradition and in the monastic traditions of Christianity and Sufism, the, the rest aspect tends to be emphasized. And in some extreme versions of these uh, the the movement aspect is uh, denied or suppressed. It is not difficult to see how this has come about because in the early stages of our investigation, everything to do with our senses and our thoughts is a distraction from our being. So in this first step of interior prayer, we enter into our closet and we close the door. We turn away from movement, perception, thought, activity, relationship, expression. All of these are considered distractions from our being. And indeed, they are distractions from our being in the early stages. If we believe and feel that we are temporary, finite, separate beings, apart from everyone and everything, and apart from God's being, then objective experience, giving our attention to objective experience, tends just to substantiate validate our sense of separation and hence this turning away from the content of experience in the early stages of prayer or meditation or investigation into our true nature. But some expressions of the great understanding then they neglect the outward facing path, the return to experience, this outer form of prayer. Somebody once said, when the journey to God comes to an end, the journey in God begins. The journey, for the journey to God, we have to enter into our closet and close the door, turn away from perception and thinking. But the journey in God requires that we turn round again and to discover that the being, the infinite, indivisible being that we now know ourself to be is the reality of everyone and everything. We share our being. In fact, there is no we to share being. Being is simply shared. So at this stage then, the world is no longer seen as a distraction, as something that 
veils or eclipses God's infinite being, but is understood instead to shine with it. We often hear in the spiritual traditions a phrase such as, the world is an illusion. It is true, the world is an illusion, but in common parlance, the word illusion suggests something that is not real. And this is a mistake. An illusion is not something that is not real. An illusion is something that is real, but does not but is not what it appears to be. The image of my face on your screen is an illusion. But there is something there. If you reach out your hand, you won't find a face, but you will find a screen. The screen is, relatively speaking, the reality of the illusory face. Likewise, the world is an illusion in the sense that it is not what it seems to be. It seems to be a multiplicity and diversity of objects and people. That is an illusion only in the sense that it is not what it appears to be. Its reality is God's infinite being. Moreover, if we are seeing an illusion, we are, by definition, experiencing its reality. It is not possible to see a movie without experiencing the screen. It's not possible to see a mirage, a pool of water, in a desert without seeing its reality, the light. It's not possible to see the illusory snake without actually seeing the rope. So if we are seeing the world and all of us are seeing the world, we are, whether we know it or not, experiencing its reality. Its reality is not veiled the reality of an illusion is not veiled by the illusion. It's veiled by the belief that the illusion is real. Your screen is not veiled by the image of my face. It would only seem to be veiled if you thought my face was real in its own right. In other words, it is not the illusion of the world that is a problem. It is the belief that the appearances are real in their own right. And this is beautifully expressed in the Sanskrit word maya, which I know many of you will know of. Maya, which is usually translated as illusion. But the less well-known meaning of the word maya is creativity or creative display indicating two different understandings of what the world is from one point of view it is an illusion that hides god's being that conceals its reality from another point of view it shines with God's being. It reveals its reality. So at this stage of our understanding, it is no longer necessary to turn our attention away from the content of experience. It would only be necessary to turn our attention away from something, if that something was other than God's being. But there is nothing other than God's being. So it doesn't matter where one's attention goes. As long as one feels and understands that all one is actually experiencing is God's being. 
Remember, the world is not what we see, it is the way we see. If we give the illusory world permission to veil God's infinite being, then it will seem to do so. If we withdraw that permission, the world which once seemed to veil God's being will now be seen and felt to shine with it as it. The great understanding that lies at the heart of all the main religious and spiritual traditions can be expressed in two simple phrases. Being is happiness and being is shared. All that is necessary for this recognition is to know the nature of our being. Happiness on the inside, peace and happiness on the inside and the felt sense of our shared being that is the experience of love or beauty on the outside are the inevitable consequence of this recognition of the nature of being. So if we ever find that we are suffering on the inside or that there is conflict on the outside, this is a sure sign that at that moment we have overlooked the nature of our being. Suffering and conflict are the two ways in which God's presence signals to us that we have overlooked it. And all that is necessary in any moment of suffering on the inside or conflict on the outside is just briefly and swiftly to return to our being, re-establish our being as God's being and return again to the situation that seemed to be the cause of our suffering or conflict and to face it informed by this understanding of our infinite and indivisible being. A mind that is accustomed to regularly and frequently bathing in the in God's presence a mind that regularly and frequently subsides into the heart losing its limitations and becomes in most cases gradually and progressively washed clean of its dualizing concepts, the concepts that divide experience into self and other. And when such a mind rises again out of the heart of being, the heart of awareness, it rises inspired with new understanding, new formulation. That is where poems and prayers are formulated. But also our sense perceptions rise again, washed clean of their dualizing tendencies. Remember what William Blake said, when the doors of perception are cleansed, 
everything will be seen by man as it is infinite this cleansing of the doors of perception is the bathing of the mind in the presence of God in infinite being such a mind is able to see beauty where others just perceive her an ordinary mundane object a tree that moves some to tears of joy is for others just a green thing that stands in the way William Blake allow everything to come to rest in God's being forget everything that has been said simply rest in the presence of God in being as being rest in being as being Be sure that if your mind does rise, make sure that whatever form it takes, that it is informed by this being, this presence, that whatever form it takes is an expression of this presence. In other words, the mind becomes the instrument through which this presence is communicated in the world. Remember the Shankaracharya's prayer. O oh my Lord, my whole being is yourself and this this mind which has been given me is your consort the life force breath and energy which you have given me are your attendants this body is the temple in which I worship you. Whatever I eat or wear or do is all part of the worship I keep on performing at this temple. Whenever I walk, I feel I'm going on pilgrimage to you. Whatever I speak, is all in praise of you. Whatever I do in this world, in any way, is all aimed at you. So there is no duality in this life of unity with yourself. For one whose mind is steeped in this understanding, or we could say steeped in God's presence, fewer and fewer thoughts and feelings arise on behalf of a temporary, finite, separate self. Not because we have done anything to it, we have not touched the apparently separate self. It simply begins to fade in our experience. And the activities and relationships that we engaged in its service just gradually 
leave us. Not because we have disciplined them or controlled them or fought with them. They have simply been undermined. have been dissolved in understanding, dissolved in God's presence. For such a mind there are only two possibilities, prayer and praise. Remember the Gospel of Thomas where Jesus says if they ask you what is the sign of God's presence in you. Tell them it is a movement and a rest. These two aspects of our life, praise and prayer. Praise is prayer in motion. Prayer is praise at rest. the inner and outer aspect. Prayer is a mind turned inwards. Praise is a mind turned outwards. And I would like to leave you with one of my favourite Poems. It's a, actually a section, quite a long section of a much longer poem by John Milton called Paradise Lost. And this section of the poem is describing Adam and Eve as they, in the Garden of Eden, as they come out of them. They've been sleeping the night in their, in their bower. And they come out in the morning, and this is their, their morning song. And it is um, beautifully expressive of a mind that sees everything in nature shining with and celebrating its reality. A mind for whom the world has lost its power to veil God's presence, its reality. And not only shines with it, but announces it. So that before any object tells us anything about itself as an object, it first announces, celebrates, praises its reality. So this is Adam in the early morning addressing this divine reality. These are thy glorious works, parent of good, almighty. Thine this universal frame, thus wondrous fair, thyself how wondrous then, unspeakable, who sittest above these heavens, to us invisible, or dimly seen in these thy lowest works, yet these declare thy goodness beyond thought and power divine. Speak ye who best can tell, ye sons of light, angels, for ye behold him, and with songs and choral symphonies, day without night, circle his throne rejoicing, ye in heaven. On earth, join all ye creatures to extol him first, him last, him midst, 
and without end. Fairest of stars, last in the train of night, if better thou belong not to the dawn, sure pledge of day that crownest the smiling morn with thy bright circlet, praise him in thy sphere while day arises, that sweet hour of prime. Thou sun, of this great world both eye and soul, acknowledge him thy greater, Sound his praise in thy eternal course, Both when thou climbest, And when high noon hast gained, And when thou fallest. Moon, that now meetest the orient sun, Now fliest with the fixed stars Fixed in their orb that flies, And ye five other wandering fires That move in mystic dance, not without song, Resound his praise, who out of darkness called up light. Air, and ye elements, the eldest birth of nature's womb, That in quaternion run perpetual circle, Multiform, and mix and nourish all things, Let your ceaseless change vary to our great maker, Still new praise. Ye mists and exhalations, That now rise from hill or steaming lake, Dusky or grey, Till the sun paint your fleecy skirts with gold, In honour of the world's great author rise, Whether to deck with clouds the uncoloured sky, Or wet the thirsty earth with falling showers, Rising or falling, still advance his praise. His praise, ye winds, that from four quarters blow, breathe soft or loud, and wave your tops, ye pines, with every plant, in sign of worship wave. Fountains, and ye that warble as ye flow, melodious murmurs warbling tune his praise. Join voices, all ye living souls, ye birds, that singing up to heaven gate ascend, Bear on your wings and in your notes his praise. Ye that in waters glide, And ye that walk the earth, And stately tread or lowly creep, Witness, if I be silent, morn or even, To hill or valley, fountain or fresh shade, Made vocal by my song, and taught his praise. Hail, universal Lord, be bounteous still to give us only good. And if the night have gathered aught of evil or concealed, disperse it now as light dispels the dark.